the okay so uh good evening everybody um tonight we are joined by john Ryder. Uh, John is a naturalist, a woodsman, wildlife tracker, and he's penned many articles and several books. Tonight, we're going to enjoy an introduction to wildlife tracking. I was thrilled when John approached SWOG, so I'm going to hand over now to our expert tracker, John Ryder. That must be me, That's I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Evening, everybody. Um, this, this, is, um, this is part of a longer um, presentation that I often do, uh, people at the Mammal Society, so I'd, we're not going to get through it all, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm sure. And um, I thought I'd, I'd focus mostly on track and sign, uh, specifically tracks, and do some principles of, of recognising track groups and individual species, perhaps, but um, it's quite an involved subject. Um, and we may not get through all the sort of subtle differences, I guess. Um, Part part of um, of what I do, um, as I said in the introduction, there is, is is wildlife tracking. It's a big part of what my work at the moment, um, and I'm trying to, um, along with several other people, we're trying to promote the, 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 it as a tool for surveying and for identifying, as well as just for recreation and for um, and, and obviously getting people outdoors. It's great for that, um, but it does have a have a more serious sort of scientific aspect potentially. And, and it's underused in in Britain, certainly um, more so than uh, or less less used certainly than other parts of the world. So I'm just gonna gonna walk through this. I'm just going to explain a little bit about um about how um I came to be involved in it. So um it does say in there in my little intro there that I'm a senior tracker with Cyber Tracker International, um and Cyber Tracker um started um in South Africa. With this guy here, Louis, Louis Leibenberg, and I'm not going to spend too long on this because um, it's quite involved and may or may not be um, as interesting to some of you as it is to me. But Louis was um, approached by um, principally Bushmen who, who asked him if they could find a way for him, for them to monetize the skills that they had around tracking and, and, and natural history. Um, so Louis um, had spent a lot of time with Bushmen and spent a lot of time um, tracking with them and was really um, very interested in tracking generally. And uh, he came up with a, um, a, a computer program that was um, able to, to capture data. Um, and it was all icon driven because most of the people he was working with um, had um, no, no real skills. They weren't very literate in, in, in terms of the written word and recording anything. So he, um, he, he developed it on a Palm Pilot and it was, uh, say, icon dri driven. So they could find the track of a line and then they could press that icon that corresponded with the, the species that they found and it would all be recorded and GPS and GIS and all that sort of stuff. And they, they found employment with that and they were um, used for presence and absence surveys and uh, mitigation around developments and roads and all of that sort of stuff. And then Louis realized very early on, really, that the, the cyber tracker um, program, if you like, the data capture bit, which is is the cyber part of tracking, which is a difficult thing often to explain to people when we talk about cyber tracker, which is why I like to get this in really early. As people assume we're sitting on the Internet chasing cars down. Um, and it's not like that's just the origins of it. We're, we're in Africa with this data capture program and in, in Europe and Britain. Um, we have our own ways of recording biodiversity, so we don't use that system. But Louis realised that that, that system would only be, only be as good as the as the data going in. So he came up with a way of evaluating trackers to see how basically good they were and grading them. Um, and he split tracking down into into track and sign identification, which is some of what we'll talk about tonight. So. Um, that's footprint analysis, scats, feeding signs, beds, all those sorts of little signs and um, and what have you that the animals and birds and insects and anything leaves behind. And then also trailing, which is picking up that that trail of sign, I guess, and um, and hopefully leading into an encounter with an animal. Um, and he came up with this very, very clever way of, of, of testing people, which is without going into too much detail, it's, it's kind of weighted in that um, you get penalize more for getting um easy questions wrong than hard questions and ultimately what it gives you is a very accurate um, view of how good somebody is as a tracker and, and how importantly in terms of, of doing scientific survey and conservation research how reliable a person would be if if they said um i think i saw somebody mentioned something in a the chat there about water bowls if somebody can say um you know, that's definitely a water bowl and not not a brown rat track then 
presumably or in theory and hopefully if they've gone through a, a system where they've been tested on their ability to identify tracks then their evidence will be more reliable than somebody that hadn't and it worked really well and it's um it spread throughout africa in in terms of conservation work but also in tourism uh, guides that are um qualified in cyber track are now uh, get paid significantly more than people that aren't it's part of their professional development um and louis took it to america or, or, or with, with the help of mark elbrook who's an american biologist mountain lion biologist and got the system going um in america and um and we brought Mark to the UK in 2012. And since then, we're working throughout Europe, in Germany, in France, Holland, Slovakia, Poland, Romania, all over the place, training and assessing trackers in both of these disciplines, in trailing and in, in track and sign. And there are ways of scoring it, but I'm going to I'm going to basically skip through these because it probably won't um, it won't be quite so much interest to you. But essentially, um, essentially, there's a series of, of sort of tests um of various difficulties that you can end up with and you can end up as either a professional tracker or a senior tracker depending on how um how well you do but i'll I'll leave that bit from now and i'll just nip straight on to talking about identifying tracks because this is probably i hope going to be the most useful um for you as you're out and about in your woods and looking in muddy puddles and um, and trying to identify stuff, uh, and the, the the principles of it are quite are quite straightforward in a way. In in, in theory, we all um well the theory is that we all all mammals descended from. This is an artist impression of um of a shrew like animal, an insectivore, that was around um in the time of the dinosaurs, I think sixty five million years ago, and survived whatever disaster um, befell the um. The, the 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 big old dinosaurs and um and eventually turned into all the mammals that we've got on the uh, on the planet at the moment and essentially their foot structure really hasn't changed so uh, the first place to sort of start really and you can look at your own hand for this um is is with your hand or with your toes i use toe pads and, and finger pads and all of that in, um, interchangeably although obviously technically in, in terms of biology your your feet are, are tarsals and your and your fingers are not tarsals because they're not toes they're something else but the principles work the same and um in terms of of, of the way things are, are labeled um in a biological sense and this isn't really a tracking sense this is how zoologists and mammologists um, number feet we all start the thumb the inside which is toe number one and then we go two three four and five um and on some animals, although the, the basic model is, is like ours, it would be five fingers or five toes. Um, sometimes um, one of those fingers is not there anymore. It's missing and it's always toe number one. It may be vestigial. It may just not show in the track, um, which I'll come into in a bit in a moment. But with some species, the um, the, the basic structure of the foot has, has slightly changed. But essentially, it's based on this model. So what we have is we have our toe pads which show up in the track and these protect the ends of the finger bones or the toe bones, however you want to call it. And they're still there on on, um, on, on mammals. Um, at the other end of the fingers, we have these palm pads or carpal pads, uh, sorry, uh, interdigital pads, pads, not carpal pads, and they protect the other ends of the bones. And sometimes on some animals, they're individual little pads. Sometimes they fuse and you've got one on the thumb as well. Um, sometimes the shape of these, if they fuse, will give you a clue as to what animal it is. If there's an asymmetry there, often even when you can't see the thumb, which can be the one that either is missing or doesn't show at all, sometimes the palm pad will actually point to where the thumb should be even when it's not there. So if you see asymmetry in this part of a track, you can start to think that maybe you've got an animal that's got five toes and not four. And then on the front, and only on the front, we have carpal pads that protect the wrist bones and on some animals these are very distinctive on some groups of animals there's one of them sometimes there's two of them sometimes one one of them is bigger than the other sometimes if there's two then they're equal and all of these things start to become diagnostic really and, and help us and obviously we've got the the, the claws and um uh, as well the equivalent of our nails which may or may not show in some species reliably and isn't usually that helpful in many species um uh, not as helpful at least as you'd think it would be um and then all the bits in between all of those pads um are what we call negative space 
and negative space is something that we 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 pay a lot of attention to um and essentially it's the bits in between pads it could be the bits in between the toe pad and the palm pad and that would give you an indication of that negative space there that would give you an indication of how long the finger was so if we're looking at things for example like squirrels which are confusable with rats so they have much longer fingers for climbing as you'd expect and sometimes the finger length or the toe length can help you um get to a, a reasonably good sort of diagnosis of, of who you're who you're um looking after and sometimes they um they they form proper shapes so these pads will go into mud for example and the the mud gets squeezed up in between the fingers and between the pads and that's still negative space but sometimes that gives a very distinctive shape um and the amount of it so uh, if we look at the the track i've labeled there on the left hand side of that um of that slide that's an american mink track they have an awful lot of um of negative space so they have big gaps in between the toes and then the palm pads and you can also see that's a right track so you can sort of see even uh, the asymmetry in the palm pad there's a little separate pad there that looks after the end of the thumb and that will often point to where that thumb should be even when you can't see the thumb so those are our basic principles and we can very broadly in some animal groups give these um, a, a track formula um, so what we end up with um in um again in a zoological classification if we start with the more primitive um foot if you like i say primitive in that it, as in prime as in the first it's what it's the earlier one um we 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 have um i guess a system of locomotion um or stand or a way of standing on their foot called plantigrade so plantigrade animals essentially are capable of walking or standing on the entire floor of their track so the carpal pads um and the palm pads and the toe pads they can all show in that track they don't always all show um but sometimes they do um and it, within that group certainly in britain anyway we've got insectivores um which are part which, which are uh, plantigrade animals so if we're struggling with the word plantigrade it's um we can just call them soul walkers if you like they're just um, standing on the soles of their feet and they will show um, five toes on the front and five toes on the rear uh, reliably, although very often the thumb doesn't show. So even when it's supposed to be there and is actually physically there, it doesn't necessarily show in the track. Um, rodents have four, four on the front and five on the rear. So um, some rodents have a little vestigial thumb, which I can show you um, at the end of this little section. I've got some feet here that we can have a look at. Um, mustelids, which are our weasels, you know, badgers, otters, pine martins, weasels, etc. They have five and five, so five on the front and five on the rear. And uh, lagomorphs are rabbits and hares, and they will have um, five on the front but four on the rear. So these helpers, these little formulas, they're not something you have to really memorize particularly, but they can help in the early stages if you're new to tracking to get you to at least a group of animals, and then you can take it from there. <clears throat> and the, the track on the on the left isn't a um isn't a british animal um but it hopefully it shows you the um some of these features of a plantigrade animal this is a a, a a grizzly bear that i um i followed a little bit in yellowstone a few years ago and you can see the um um uh, something else we can talk about generally on animals that have even length legs very often the front track is um is a lot wider rounder bigger than the rear track because it's supporting the weight of the head and the shoulders so if you imagine yourself going on all fours most of the weight of your body is in your shoulders and arms and upper body and head um, so it makes sense that you've got a flatter base to to support all of that um, so what we see here is we see on the on the right hand side of the of the picture we have um, we have the front track uh, and the line furthest to the left of that track, the little line of dots there are the claws. The next line in are the toe pads. The next big blocky bit in there is the um, is the palm pad. And then we've got a carpal pad on there, which um, also, because they only occur on the front track, means that has to be a front track. And then what's happened is, is as the animal's walked, it's overstepped with its hind track, which is the one on the left, much smaller, not as round, um, and it's gone beyond. So it's an overstepped walk. It's gone beyond its front track. And the little dot you can see at the back isn't a, uh, a carpal pad. It's like almost like the equivalent of the heel. 
So these animals, these soul walking animals, plantigrades, um, can show every uh, every aspect of the foot in the in the track regularly. They don't always. You don't always see the carpal pad, but very often you do. And uh, another thing, actually, for identifying these things, oftentimes the palm pad on on plantigrade animals, again, not always, is is the deepest part of the track. So you can certainly see the palm pad on that front track is deeper than the toes in the snow. Um, another way of of, of um, classifying animals and this is supposedly it's um it's an evolutionary response um for speed at least that's what I've, I've read some animals have um instead of walking flat on the soles of the of their feet if you like they've come up on their digits and they're standing on their toes and what happens at least with the animals we've got in in, in the uk um, the thumb has gone up the up the arm a little bit um and becomes the dew claw on the front track of a dog um and then the fingers, I guess, are, are sort of stretched out usually a little bit. And these palm pads are all fused into one big mass, into one big sort of lump. So the digity grades are finger walkers, if you like. They've gone up and they're walking on the on the fronts of the the or the very tips of their fingers. Um, and generally speaking, wild dogs at least um, don't have a dew claw on the rear, so their track formula becomes four, five on the front and four on the rear. Um, some domestic breeds do have dew claws on the rear. It's basically what's left of, of toe number one, the thumb. And in Britain um, and Europe, really, we haven't got a lot of choice. We've got wolves, jackals, foxes, dogs uh, in the canine family. And then we've got lynx and wild cats and domestic cats and that sort of stuff with our felines. But essentially, the formula there is um, is the same wherever you are. So once you recognise cat dog tracks, once you recognise rodents and weasels and plantigrade animals like that they're the same the world over and you can go to a different region and quite easily um, at least get it to a group and if you do a little bit of research beforehand you can usually be quite good at guessing which one it is the trap picture there is an iberian lynx which i found in the doniana national park and followed that for a bit and hopefully we'll have time to do a little bit more on the specifics of um of identifying these to sort of species level in a minute. But then our final uh, group are our Ungulli grades. Um, so these have gone even further forward. If we imagine, um, I'm assuming you can see my hands while I'm doing this because I can't see myself. Um, if you if you think about having our um, our finger pad and then our nail, uh, and, and on a digitally grade animal like a dog, for example, their nail grows out into a claw. What happens on the ungulli grades or the hoofed, uh, hoofed animals is the toe pad is still present, but the nail forms this modified hoof wall. And I can show you one in a, in a sec. Um, the in, underside of that is kind of um, hollow. Um, and then the outside, the hoof wall itself, is the unguous, um, which is what they're walking on. Um, which is why they're called uh, un ungulates, because they're walking on the unguous. Or nail walkers might be another way of, of describing them. So these are hoofed animals, and most of the ones we've got in Britain are, um, are even-toed ungulates. So they've got two splits, two cleats in there, um, except for the horse and the donkeys and those sorts of things. And they're effectively, supposedly, walking on what's left of just toe number three um, and a few of the fingers fused in. So they're walking on the nail or a modified nail of um of that central toe um and the soft bit in there which i think horse horse people call the frog that's basically the toe pad so the toe pad's still there and then you've got this modified nail in other parts of the world like in africa they get more exciting sort of um odd toed ungulates like um, like hippos which i think have got three toes um but ours are basically two or um or single so if we go down into this a little bit um further and i'm hoping you can so you can see the screen here. I just want to do some, um, uh, see the camera, sorry. I just want to do some um, simple, obvious, I guess, ways of identifying things to these, these specific family groups. And then some of it, there's more subtle detail, which hopefully we can get into. Um, some of it um, is difficult to tell them apart. But essentially, if you, um, I'm assuming we can all see this, if I hold this up, good. So this is a, this is the rear track of a squirrel, um, and we've got a squirrel on the on the um, ink pad. So this is a, a captive animal that I ran over ink, 
And what I found when we brought when we brought Mark back to the UK is that a lot of the stuff that was written about tracking wasn't wasn't entirely accurate or it wasn't um, complete. So I went to um, as a there's a British Wildlife Centre not far from where I live uh, near Horsham in Sussex, and um, we we because we had known species, we could get them to uh, run across ink traps and really start to study these tracks and see if there was any real way of telling them apart to species level. And in, in most cases, you can um, if you've got good tracks. Sometimes you, it's not enough, um, you know, just from the odd track here and there, you need a bit more. But um, but essentially, you know, it is possible to get nearly all of these things to species level. Telling things like red squirrels and grey squirrels apart, I don't think it's possible. There are a few exceptions to that, but certainly our mice and voles and our rats and water voles. Um, so essentially, if we took, think about the hind tracks, so the track formula for rodents was five on the rear and four on the front. So we've got this. Um, this is the rear track of a grey squirrel. And what we see, um, and this shows up in the track, is, is three central leading toes almost in a row, which is what one of those arrows is pointing to. So with, before we go any further, if you have three tracks pretty much in a row, sorry, three leading toes in a row, you're dealing with a rodent. And then you can just think about all the other things as to what road, which road it is. And then the two outer toes, so toes one and toes five, in effect, um, stick out to the edges. And that's very classically um, a rodent um, structure. Uh, on the squirrel, they've got a pad pretty well for every one of those toes. In the track, they fuse into this mass. Um, some things like rats have got little individual pads that, again, you know, would would fuse, but are perhaps better better space than this. And then hopefully what you can see from the ink and what you can see from this one I'm, I'm holding up is that there's a quite a quite a distance between the toe pad and the palm pad, which is suggesting long fingers, which is suggestive as an animal that um, that's got dexterous fingers as, as squirrels have. And there's a photograph of the squirrel next to that. That's a gray squirrel, I think, in that photo. If we look at the fronts, um, and these are these have dried, so they've shriveled a little bit. But the drawing there is um, is is um, is pretty obvious as to how they look in in the world in the real world, as it were. So what we have is we have this um, this little central mass, which is quite symmetrical in most rodents, and very often forms is is formed of like three little pads that fuse, and often looks like a little kidney bean, and then the the four front toes um fingers in effect are arranged in a really nice arc and very often they're, they're quite symmetrical when they're not symmetrical then that can be diagnostic and what we have with um with with rodents is um is you have two uh, identically sized carpal pads that sit behind those palm pads and you don't always see those it depends on the substrate and how good it's um it's capturing the track but if you see um, three, if you get a set of tracks and you're seeing three leading toes in a row, you're dealing with the hind foot of a of a um, of a rodent. And if you can see two equal sized carpal pads, you're dealing with a rodent. There's no nothing else in Britain certainly that would have two even sized spaced um, symmetrical carpal pads. What we do have on many species, and you can you might you might actually struggle to see this but there's a little bump here just under my finger under this finger and that's actually the remains of the thumb so at some point in the evolution of this animal it did have a thumb and it's become vestigial so it's just a little bump and it sits on the side of the carpal pad and sometimes you will see that in the track as well rats have it as well and mice so those are essentially rodent features I'm just going to go through some of these and um, we with, with almost the exception of some of the larger rodents, but it's a similar sort of principle. This is a beaver um, track and you can see on the front track that they, they do have a, a thumb and it does show um, occasionally in the track, but it's pretty well vestigial. Um, and they've got such such big hind where big webbed hind feet, they tend to just um, stand directly on their front tracks and um, and you don't see them very much anyway. But they're so distinctive, they're they're kind of. Um, unmistakable uh these are these are the next sort of size down really that we'll commonly see in um in britain are gray squirrels and red squirrels and um and edible dormice if you're in the right part of the country for them um some of the um and you can see those features on there a little bit better i've exaggerated them so you, hopefully you can see the the 
the, the carpal pads and the three in a row and all of that sort of stuff that goes on. In theory, some of the old books suggest that the um, that red squirrels register the palm pads, these pads, a lot less strongly than grey squirrels do. But in reality, I don't think that's possible. Um, I think um, even though in theory, red squirrels are smaller than, um, than grey squirrels, I've run them over um, ink and very often they're, they're identical in size uh, and size just how we're talking about that is is um is really not a very good way of measuring tracks the morphology of a track is um, is a much better way to get to an identification than it is to sort of start measuring it because there's so much variety with young animals and with slippage and all sorts of stuff in the soil but the the, the physical features don't change so you know a baby fox looks like a medium-sized fox looks like a big fox they're just size is different but the morphology is the same um what becomes distinctive um about edible dormice and this 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 is true of hazel dormice which are of conservation interest so you might be more interested in 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 recording them is they they seem to sort of walk with their hands out like chameleons when they leave trails it's very distinctive they 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 kind of do that um which makes them very um distinctive compared to something like a rat for example um and we could quickly um, quickly look at this. I don't know um, how, how well this is showing on your screens, but what I what I found um, with a lot of research is that um, is that there is a significant difference, I think, between mice and rats and voles. And this seems to be with with small voles like bank voles and field voles, and um, and also with water voles and rats. And that if we look at those arrangements on their front feet, where you've got four in a row. Uh, sorry four in a nice arc going around the central pad and what you find with with um with rats um and mice is that they're they're, they're asymmetrical and i think the um it's, it's usually the little finger seems to drop out so the distance between the little finger and the next one in is greater usually than the distance between all the others um it's something to look for because it seems to be work seems to work and i think it could be because rats and voles have these um vestigial um thumbs and i think maybe it's because it leaves room in the foot for this or did which is why it drops down further but that's just a, a guess um and then when we look at voles if you can pick a front track and if you split that track in half it would look completely symmetrical sometimes it doesn't show as well as you would hope um sometimes you know you need a trail to see these things but you can usually get a get an average um <clears throat> they're also much more likely to have symmetrical hind tracks on rats and and voles and asymmetrical ones on sorry on rats and mice and asymmetrical ones on voles so the voles um the outer the outer two toes on the three toes in a row tend to hug each other tend to touch a little bit um, although that's not as I don't think as reliable as um as the front tracks. But something to look out for. It is possible to identify them. But also, by the way, they move as well, which we haven't really got time to go into, but um voles tend to trot and um and mice and rats tend to bound, and you can see that in their trail patterns. Um but gates and trail patterns are quite involved. We'll see how far we go with that. Um I think that's just um showing more of the same. There's just a rat there as well showing that same um, that same scenario and all these are, are known animals that we ran over ink to be sure and there's some um, pictures of them so ho hopefully um the yellow neck mouse um if you can see those images hopefully hopefully they look um they look reasonably clear um but if you follow the the end of the ruler down on the left hand track where it says centimeters upside down follow that straight down to that track if you can see it if you can blow it up that's the front track of a of a bank vole again it's an animal i caught and put over some mink clay um, and you can see how symmetrical it is and then when you look at the um, the front track on the other page of a yellow neck mouse then hopefully you can see that this toe lowest down in the in the picture on the front track which is the one on the left is dropping a lot further out it's quite subtle but when you get used to seeing it um, these things start to sort of jump out at you so you, you can get them to species level um, you might ask why would you bother obviously but you, it can be done if you want to and this is a similar sort of thing with um, with with uh, water voles, which I think there was a question about. So we've got a rat um, 
on the left hand side uh, brown rat and we've got water bowl on the on the right and um there's a couple of other features that I would look for in in water bowls. They tend to do this. They tend, they tend their fingers tend to go out all sorts of angles, and they're much less likely to 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 point um, forward. Um, and they're very symmetrical. Certainly, the front tracks. Um, and there is a front track right in the centre of that of that right hand image that you can hopefully compare with the um, with, with with the rat track. So it is possible to tell those apart quite quite easily, really, when you get used to looking at it. And they've become such a conservation kind of mystery in a way. But the reality of it is that, you know, once you look at this, like you look at anything, the sort of human brain and the human eye is, is incredible at, at finding subtle differences. It stops being that kind of um, that complicated, if, if that sort of makes sense. Um, well, at least I sort of think so. And the the other thing we can think about, and the, and again, hopefully this is illustrating a little bit of um, uh, of what I was talking about a moment ago with the edible dormouse. This is um, this is a hazel dormouse. Um, they're very long fingers for their size, so pretty much all of them are well ahead of the um, all of their toes are well ahead of their palm pads with a good um, a good negative space showing long fingers, and also just sticking out to the sides. And this one you can see um, on the on the ink trail where it's it's kind of bounding. It's making these little leaps, and its backside's hitting the ink at the same time. So you can see it's a little bum mark as well, maybe a bit of tail drag. But many of those, um, if you look at the, the the orientation of the trail, the hands are going out to the sides, which um, seems to be common with these things. So um, we talked a bit about. This is just another example of of, um, of something slightly different in that because we talked about palm um, pads and toe pads and all that sort of thing. There are a, a whole bunch of animals that um, the lagomorphs that don't have pads, or at least they do have pads, but they're covered in really thick hair. So one of the characteristics when you see a rabbit or a hair track to identify it is the absence of anything. So if you see a lot of negative space, then you start to think. Perhaps that could be, um, you know, a rabbit or a hare or an Arctic hare. Um, and often, all you all you see, which I've dri I have drawn on this um, on that rabbit track on the left hand side, often all you see is a line of claws. Um, and oftentimes, you don't see the thumb. So this this would be the front track, and you see this uh, inverted J shape. So it's very the front track of a of a rabbit or a hare is very asymmetrical, even when the thumb does show, which isn't very often um it's completely out balanced um the, the rear tracks are much more symmetrical although there's al always a difference there as well and i can probably show you um show you this so i, I had this um this is an arctic hare foot which the moths got to uh, sadly but what was quite interesting about it was that um, was that it revealed all the bone structure, and you can see that the pads um, are there, but they're behind all of this fur, which is why very often all you see are these sharp claws. Uh, this is a rear; it's only got four. Um, it's only got four claws on it, but you can see they're quite asymmetrical, even even so. Um, and often, as I say, all you see is the line of claws, which I've drawn next to the, that rabbit track. Um, telling rabbits and hares can be difficult as a real crossover with size, certainly in other parts of Europe. Um, if you can see the full front track, um, what we find is that the, the thumb on a hare um, drops a long way down in the track compared with that of a rabbit, which is almost in line with the little finger, toe number five. Hopefully that will make, make sense from the drawing there. Get a couple of other feet ready. And often you know, when they sit back, as I've drawn with that hair, and rabbits can, and, and the same with the rabbit, they can sit back and show this big heel area. But very often you don't see anything, and everything just looks really out of focus. Um, and that's that's an example of of that. Um, so what we, the one on the left is the front track of a rabbit. You can just about see the hair in there. And you can see tiny impressions of where the pads are pushing through the fur. 
Um, and you can also see the claws in that J shape. And then the one on the um, on the right is gone on top of a pheasant track for scale there. Um, and you can see that inverted J shape and then very, very faint impression of the um, of the thumb. So you can say that's a front right and it's almost in line with the little finger. So hopefully that, that illustrates that one. And these are yeah, more examples of it. So we've got a hare in a typical running pattern on the on the left. When hares and rabbits run, their hind tracks overtake their front tracks. So it, it can look like in your mind, you'd think it was going from left to right because the front tracks should be in the front, but they're not. They're overtaken. It's going left to right, which you can see from the claws and the orientation of the claws there. Um, that's a brown hare. And then this is a, a rabbit. The one on the right is a rabbit making a sharp turn. But again, all you've got is those claws showing. There's no, none of this because it's covered in fur is making any real kind of impression. It's almost like you get a vague shadow um, when it does register. So I think we showed those. Am I muted? Sarah Sorry, I, I was I was trying to unmute myself and I muted you, John. <laughs> I'm sorry. I wanted to ask, you know, on the the uh, the rabbit that did the sharp turn, what was it that yeah. makes is it is it its tail that makes the swoosh or is it like the heel, do you think? Oh uh, that that's that's a that's that's something else. That's um that's a, a different that's a track over the top of it. Right. Oh, okay. It looks like a human track. I was imagining like a cartoon like screech around. Yeah. <laughs> they, they do this when they chase each other, obviously when they're evading things, but when they're um when they're when they're mating and they chase each other around, you, you get a lot of this this skidding and turning. You get a lot with hairs as well, obviously when they're boxing. Um they can make some really funky track patterns. Okay. Did anybody else have any questions? I can Difficult because I'm talking to an empty room. I don't know whether this is going in or not. <laughs> oh, it is. I've, it's just because I muted everybody as they came in, John. Okay. That's, it's uh, there. They're not. They're not being silent. <laughs> I've just made. Them <laughs> <laughs> but people, please, if you have questions, now's the time. <laughs> if you unmute yourselves or type them. And I'll carry on then. Keep on keeping on. I'll carry on. Um, so our insectivores, and we've only got five really. We've got we've got moles and um, and hedgehogs and three types of shrew, um, and these have five on the front, and five on the rear. If it shows um, mole tracks, if you do find them, and I have found them uh, occasionally, um, moles will often go above ground when when they get either washed out or whether it's so uh, when it's so dry that they can't dig or they can't find. Um, uh, and the food they'll often come above ground and move and they do that when they're sick as well and um I, i've seen them moving around and caught their tracks i've got some photos coming in later of, of, of that um and because they've got these weird sort of spade shaped front tracks what we end up with is a, is a line of five in, a, in an arc moving forwards um, from the rear tracks and then you have this arc of of five if you see all five of them um coming on a slightly different orientation and they're usually further apart than that i haven't um, drawn that particularly well but um it's, it's so distinctive when you see them the only thing you can you can mix that up with is is toad tracks believe it or not because toads can look a lot like mole tracks because often they just register their claws but the orientation is going um out as it were moles are going like this and toads go out that way with that line of five so it's possible to to identify them. Um, in terms of hedgehogs, we've got some hedgehog feet in here. Um, again, you know, like all of these, like all of these um, uh, creatures, very often the uh, the thumb doesn't show. This is a hind track of a, of a hedgehog. I wanted to show this because. Um, Hopefully you can see, um, although we've effectively got three in a row, a little bit like a, a rodent track, um, what we also have is very short negative space. So these toe pads, and you can see that from the drawing, which again was taken off 
I think um, they're almost touching the palm pattern. They're quite oval shaped. And then the, the, the rear in particular has, um, has a very long claw on the inside. And um, it shows very often in the track. Sometimes all you see is those three on the hedgehog track and this one being significantly longer. And I think it's uh, it's a grooming claw because it's closest to the body. And I think it gets in between the spines, although that's a bit of a guess. But it's um, it's definitely something that hedgehogs have. So hedgehogs are commonly confused with rat tracks. So we need to look at the shape of the ovalness, as it were, of the toe pads, because they're dots on rats. And they're also the, the real lack of negative space, which is very, very typically, again, compared with rats. And my bits back in. Um, and these are fun to, to set up with, um, with, with tunnels and, um, and you can put ink, um, mammal society sell lots of hedgehog tunnels, or you can put different substrates in. So these are, these are tracks that I've got of hedgehogs from, um, well, the one on the, the right was a captive animal and that's a rear track. And you can see how long that, um, grooming claw is, and you can see how short the negative space is. And then the, uh, the one on the right is a trail that I put in a hedgehog tunnel and uh, I just put sand in there instead of ink just to get something different. So you, you, it can be um, that you go out to survey for these things and look in muddy puddles, or you can you can um, set yourself up somewhere that will catch a track, which we yeah, we tend to call them track traps. So a track trap is anything natural that will hold a track, or you can just make one with sand or ink. And that's a mole trail. So that's one that was above ground last summer or the summer before. So, um, so hopefully you can see the tracks that are, are arcing and um, just to the side, which are the front tracks. And then if you look really closely, you might have to peer in there. They're much less um, deeply marked. You can see the rear tracks, which are much more sort of um, horizontal to the to the line of travel. So it's not unusual to see them, um, well, it is, um, but it's not impossible, should I say, to see them. Um, and if we we talk about mustelids, um, so mustelids are really quite um, an interesting group in that we've got we've got several animals in there of conservation interest. Obviously, this is an otter, um, and otters are are of conservation interest. Um, pie martins are of, of conservation interest. So polecats, and so are mink. You know, arguably because of their in, invasive nature, there. So they're something that we we should be sort of thinking about. You know, in terms of conservation. Um, and I will go through some of the differences on these, um, but just while we're there, instinctively you would think this is a is a rear track um, of an otter, and, and this is an otter, and it's not, it's a front track, and the big circle at the back that you'll see in there is a carpal pad, <clears throat> it's not a heel pad, and I don't know whether you can see this very clearly, I can sort of see it okay from where I am, the, the pads above that, there's, there's, there's essentially like three shapes that are described um, in the palm pad uh, so to the to the left of that carpal pad that wrist protector um, and in all mustelids we describe this as a croissant so it's um it, it's usually a little bit fatter in the middle and then you have two drooping down to the sides it's a bit more compact than an otter but the structure's still there and what we also have is um is the fifth toe there which is the the, the toe at the track uh, at the top of the tr track picture uh, registering quite weakly which is very common um, it's quite in line with the opposite toe, which also helps us to identify this as a front track, because on rear tracks, that thumb drops a lot further down. Um, I can probably show you this, because I've got some otter feet, actually. So um, they're a bit shriveled. This was a roadkill otter, um, but it does serve to illustrate that this is the carpal pad at the back. It's absolutely huge on, a, on an otter track. Another way to identify otters, and we'll, we can go through this a bit for more in the next slide, um, is that they have the quite relatively blunt claws and they're kind of, um, they grow right out of the top of the pads. So when they show, they appear as if they're stuck to the pad. There's no, there's no gap between the ends of the claw and the toe pad, which isn't always the case with some of the mustelids. Um, so it can be something that we're going to look at. 
And um, we'll start with something simple though. So our biggest one is um, our biggest muscle is our is our badger. And although this this is all fused, it still has a Quasson effect. And it still thins down or points down on the right hand side towards the little um, the little thumb tone number one. So it shows you where it is, even though it doesn't register. So essentially what we have with the badger is we have um, at least four of those main toes all, <clears throat> all in front of the palm pad, which is a blocky rectangular, slightly thinning towards the center of the trail um, pad. Quite short negative space, they haven't got particularly long thumbs. And then they also have a carpal pad that will show, which I've drawn there. Um, on the front tracks, much longer claws, which can be shown in the distance between the pads um, and, and the tips of the claws. Or sometimes in soft substrate, you'll see the whole line of the claws going in there. They look like little bears, actually. Um, and then the rear track, similar thing in terms of the toes, like four of them all ahead of the palm pad but much shorter claws, no carpal pad, but occasionally when they sit back, you see effectively what is a heel. And then hopefully with that otto um, track on the right, we can you can sort of see that croissant and how it's forming in the carpal pad um, and those little claws that are dug in, if you like, um, to the end of the toe pad. They're quite, they're quite bulbous, round. Um, it's very common to confuse otters with uh, with dogs and cats. Uh, at least for ecologists when they're surveying, they often get that that wrong. Um, I've drawn the webbing in there, but very often you don't see webbing in otters. And there are a lot of other things that we use, which we won't have time really to cover, like how the animals move, because some of these animals move in very specific gates. And if you can get a trail of tracks, that can really help you um, help you sort of guess what it is. Well, not guess, hopefully be more accurate what it is. Um, and these are these are some examples of badger tracks for real, as it were. Um, the one, the one on the left, you won't see. I don't think very easily, but there are some little claws, and sometimes on hard substrates, there's a fallow deer going up in here. All you see are these tiny little claws. Um, you don't necessarily see the whole of the track. And then the other one is um, is is really obviously um, soft mud, and you can see the length of the claws from the the front track. There, and you could say that was a front um, left because you can see the thumb on that one as well. So we can um, and sometimes ask those sorts of questions in um, in tracking evaluations, get somebody to say which corner of the animal was it. <coughs> and, and this is um, this is an otter. And this uh, I like I like to put this one in because it illustrates um, how you can sometimes tell how this animal uh, what this animal is from the way it's moving so this is is doing a, effectively a kind of lope where they um otters will land and their front front feet will come down and then the two rear pads will come down after the front tracks have, have, have sort of left so they do this kind of like concertinering effect and it leaves this track pattern where you get um, four in a row and then you get a gap and then you get another four and it just continues down the trail and badgers for example don't move that way cats don't move that way dogs which also people confuse these with don't move that way so if you're seeing some of these specific patterns and they go for a reasonable period of time that can also help you um, in terms of being able to identify which animal it is um and this this is a, a, a fairly, just a classic illustration really of of a mustelid and hopefully showing the croissant that I was talking about. So uh, pine martins, long claws, um, long thin claws really um, for climbing, quite long toes. So the oops, so the negative space there is I don't know why it's doing that. The negative space there is quite long, suggesting long fingers. Um, the toe pads are. are quite teardrop shaped on a lot of the um of the muster leads. Um and I say carpal pad would show on the on the front if you're lucky. Pine martins and stone martins or beech martins that you get in um in Europe, um we don't think we can tell them apart from their tracks anyway. And those are some um, real life examples of pine martin tracks, which really do show the, the croissant and show that that little um, toe number four is is really not um, is really not very obvious. Um, very often, though, you will find a little pad on the end of that croissant, if you like, that shows you exactly where it should be, even if it's not there. 
Um, another another good one to sort of be start thinking about telling apart uh, mink and um, and polecats. They're very similar sized animals. Um, mink, particularly on the front tracks, a um, little bit like water voles. Maybe it's a swimming thing. Um, they all seem to go starburst. So basically, how it's been described to me is that all the toes point in different directions on mink tracks. Um, they're much more um, likely to be compact much more likely to face forward um and there's also quite a lot of negative space in the mink track they've got quite long long toes associated with that and they will um they do have webbing but it very rarely shows in the track in fact i've hardly ever seen it um and it's a set a lot lower down than it is on an otter more towards the base of the toe rather than the top of them and you can see hopefully from there which is true of all of these mustelids pretty much that the hind tracks um the the thumb on the hind track drops down a lot further than than the, the thumb on the front track in all of these species <laughs> excuse me um and polecat claws are much um are much more built for digging when you see them much more robust and mink um often a little bit like um they, they form these little teardrop pinch uh, often very often there isn't a negative space between the end of the toe and the start of the claw on a mink although not not always not so much as it is um for example in um in stoats they do that a lot and these are mink tracks And that's got arrows pointing at it. That was a question. And whose track is that on an evaluation? So, John. So, John. So, uh, like, depending on the um, the weather conditions, what's the what are the best? Is there a best season to um, be identifying tracks in? So it looks like when it's raining, it's, it's less defined. Is there what, what what would you rank the seasons as in order of best to worst, if you like? It, it didn't really matter to be honest. I mean, and, and those two tracks on the on the on the screen at the moment um, are a good example of this because one one was in a muddy puddle, the one on the right, and the other was in a really exceptionally dry summer, and everything turned to dust. Right. So you just kind of get used to to identifying them in in different substrates. Right. Uh, obviously, if you go out tracking and it's just really peed down with rain, then you might you might not see them. So I'd just look at the individual weather conditions and if it's really frozen, then it wouldn't um, take a track quite so well. Um, oftentimes, though, you know, you can you can you can find places where animals would naturally go like under bridges and um, and, and and survey that way. Okay. Um, in terms of trailing animals, we tend to follow a lot of ungulates around because they're easy to find in Britain and they're, they're easier to follow than some soft footed animals. But um uh, and I, I'd say if you're going to learn, I would do that uh, from autumn, winter time when you've got a lot of leaf litter in the ground, because trailing is, is is completely different to this in many ways. And that you can you can follow an animal all day long and never see what a normal person would call a clear track. You're looking at the at shapes in leaves and things that aren't uh, 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 on the surface. They're not identifiable until you really know what you're looking for. Right. Um, and doing that in very dry weather is quite hard. Yeah. So. We've got a few questions in the chat so um i wondered if we could if i read those out and then perhaps we get some responses to that is that okay with you john yeah yeah right so the first question that appears to be here is for rodents are the tail prints used to aid identification or the absence of them not not particularly no if you see them great it just adds to it but um they they very often don't show I mean, they can tell you behaviour when they sit down and and um, wash their faces. Their, their tails show in the trail, and you can see that. But to to get a rodent track, you know, three in a row and two carpal pads is is so diagnostic of rodents. Right. You probably don't have to rely on on the on the tail feathers. Sorry, on the tail. It's like um, say feathers there, because I was thinking about pheasants as well, because people talk about seeing the trail tail drag of a pheasant, but very often you don't see it. So relying on it. Um, a little bit like claws in a way they can help when you see them but so many animals that do have claws don't show them in the track right okay um another question from simon um when i see a trail worn through the woodland is it likely to be used by more than one type of animal yes definitely yeah the animals are like line of least resistance and you see that with um with 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 animals you know badger might make a run and then deer will start to use it 
and you see it with even lions in Africa, they'll walk along human made roads because okay. um, they're going in a straight, easy line, and then they'll just go off when they when they need it, need to. Right. Okay. And um, we've got another question from Victor. Um, can you determine the health status of an animal based on the depth of the impression, e.g., underweight or overweight, injured, or is this dependent on the substrate? You can tell injuries. Okay. Certainly, because that shows up in the trail. We find uh, when an animal's limp, um, that the whether they're underweight or overweight, there's such a variety of, of of weights in in animals. I'd say that would be very difficult um, and probably not very pro pro uh, possible. Um, I mean, the more the better the substrate, the more you're going to see. You, you can, I guess, you can see. You know, there's a certain energy in a trail that 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 goes when an animal's not particularly um healthy but yeah it, it's not it's not that reliable i would say okay so you say you could tell the, the speed and the direction and maybe the health status Are they the big the big things that you can tell yeah i mean you could tell if an animal had a limp or was missing a leg or yeah there's 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 uh, you read all sorts of things about you know telling whether an animal's got a full bladder or not from its tracks i don't i don't i can't do that um i don't know whether that's anybody can but um, if you can't do it john i don't, I don't think i don't think many people <laughs> well, do i don't know but you know there are some things that you because there's so much there's such a variety between males and females i mean when you look at um at muster leads, you know the, the males can be 20 percent bigger than a female if you think about a, a male ferret compared to the female ferret and he has much bigger feet and then you have this issue with um with uh, male um well say male weasels and female stoats and cro there's a crossover there and that that's difficult to to separate and may not always be possible as well so there's there's a certain sort of um i think there's a certain fantasy attached around tracking and then there's a certain reality of um of, of what's actually possible when you when you're out there um especially if you're if you're using it to trail animals you know then that you want to go and see them and and for to get to the higher levels of cyber track of the system, you have to take the evaluator into the animal uh, without it seeing you and get out, hopefully without it being um, disturbed. So, you, you know, you are really getting to, to quite a good level of, of tracking. And um, so it gives you a pretty good idea of what is and isn't possible and what's realistic. Right. OK. Um, do we have any questions from um, anybody else in the chat? And please feel free to unmute yourselves if you'd like to say your questions out loud or type them if you prefer me to read them. Um, in the meantime, while we're waiting for people to conjure up their questions, um, my colleague Mary is going to share some links in the chat, if that's okay, if I put her on the spot. Oh, here we go. Right, so um, thank you, Mary. What animal have you found to be the most elusive or difficult to track? Mm -hmm. soft-footed animals any of them okay <laughs> to, to actually trail i mean and if we talk about tracking as in to catch up with them once you start following bears and lions and things that have soft soft foot and mountain lions that they, they they don't damage the ground in quite the same way right okay um and they're, they're quite hard to trail you can imagine if a if a if a cat goes across a load of deep, dry leaf litter it's it's going to be very difficult to follow that okay and, and some cats and some the, the the again this fantasy from reality i'd say that you can follow anything across as long as the substrate's right you can you can sort of follow mice but you probably only follow them in snow or sand and then once they go on to something else you're not going to be able to find them um and there is an element when you're following animals that you 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 kind of don't necessarily try and follow them across places where they're not leaving tracks you try and predict where they've gone somewhere and you find a track trap to back that up um so it's all substrate dependent, really. Okay, thank you. So we've got a couple more questions and then um, I think we'll have to wrap it up because I think uh, you probably want to go for your tea, John, unless you're going to go and try and... <laughs> try and <track laughs> I don't think we get really. through, through all of this. But, but, <laughs> uh, um, so I would like to say to Jane, are we going to look at bird tracks? Tonight's talk was exclusively about um, uh, mammals. Um but maybe that's something we can do in the future if we if you'd ever come back and visit. I've just just written a um a bird trap book that'll be out in April actually. 
Okay, and that brings me on to my next uh, point of order, and that is the links that my uh, colleague Mary has shared is if any of you have not done your Christmas shopping yet, we have linked in John's uh, URL for his books and some of his courses. So that might be quite nice for some of you to investigate. And uh, I will share those links around um, after the event as well. And I'll put them in the the copy of the YouTube that I will uh, pop up. Um Two questions uh, from Steve. Uh, would using a sand trap or such like be suitable to help learn these tracks as a complete newbie? I think Steve speaks on behalf of a few of us here. Yes, definitely. And and also if you if you can, um, and I did a lot of this when I was trying to to work out what was what. If you can put a trail camera on there, so you know that a certain animals walk through there, and then that can also help. Oh, so sort of like you can test yourself and then prove it to yourself. Yeah, well, also, otherwise you might get a, a rodent track going through there and, and go, well, that's a rodent, but I don't know which one. And and I, I, I was sort of lucky in a way that I had access to these captive animals. But, yeah, certainly I, I also put trail cameras on there and you can, you know, hopefully you can see it. If you see a hedgehog walk in, you can kind of think, well, they've got to be hedgehog tracks. And it, it does accelerate your your learning. Yeah, well, well, maybe not even sand, to be honest. If you can just, um, you can prepare it. You know, if you, if you take... Um, I don't know a plasterous trowel out and just find a muddy puddle and just smooth it over. Um, you don't have to necessarily carry sand around with you, although if you if you if you've got it, then great. Uh, certainly, when we were working on the bird trap book in the last two or three years, uh, my bird feeders out here, there's sand and clay and everything all around them, and there was a lot of like, watch the watch the bird land and then rush out really quick before something else landed on it, so you could identify it as what it was, because uh, otherwise you just have a whole bunch of tracks that you that you're not sure who left them. Right. That seeks perfectly to our, um, I would put links on our, um, on our Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. Uh, and that is about the trail cam competition that we are having as a monthly um, thing with uh, Woodlands. Um, and if you look on Woodlands TV, YouTube, you will see the winner of the November. Um, and my final grand finale question is, uh, John, have you ever um, tracked or identified big cats in the wild in the UK? Let's end with a a big question like that not not in the uk no I've, I've i've found links and mountain lions and lions and leopards and i've trailed those in other parts of the world and i've not seen anything that looked like a big cat track right okay. in britain uh thank you so I'd much love to, if anybody sees one give me a call i'd love to try and find follow it and see if there actually really are out there or not legend has it they might be <laughs> um so angie says the cyber track evaluations are one of the best things that i've done and very addictive can 100 percent recommend using uh, and joining john for his tracking evaluations well thank you angie <laughs> well that, those track and sign ones just just to just to um expand on what angie's saying there because because they've done like a workshop so the idea is that i would find a question i ask everybody the question and they we record their answers and then once everybody's given their answer then i i can explain why i think it is what it is so it's it's not like you get a test and then you get your result two weeks later you get as soon as you've asked your question and i answer it then you'll get feedback on it um and the reason that works so well is because if, if we say ask a question about fox track and then i explain why it's a fox and not a dog i don't have to ask you another fox track through the whole of the evaluation so it's not as if you're being taught the answer and then asked the question so that that's why I think that's why Angie likes it so much in a way is because you get that immediate feedback and you know exactly why it is what it is, and you get a chance to argue. And sometimes I get it wrong and we have a big discussion and I change my answer because um, sometimes I haven't seen what the what the students have seen. So it's um, it's a great learning experience from that that point of view, and it's something uh, that Louis wanted to bring in because it's very much based on the way uh, Bushman um go out tracking and 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 hunting and that they um they don't they all they all come to a consensus as to what what the animal is and it's not always the most experienced tracker that gets noticed and listened to so he was trying to bring a bit of that in there that that group discussion and peer learning it's uh and it's great what comes out in some of those discussions so it is a good experience okay I think a bit of beginner's look, I'd need a bit of beginner's look to uh, get started on this. But Well, yeah, but it, that's the point, though. I mean, because you're getting all the answers, even if you don't know anything, as long as you don't worry about whether you're going to get a certificate or not, because there is a certain percentage that you have to score the lowest level, um, you'll still learn a lot. Uh, obviously, you know, a sticker as well. <laughs> well, yeah. But I mean, a workshop's more structured because we can go through all of these things rather than just the tracks we find, because it's all done in the field. We don't bring anything in. We just walk through the woods and... And ask questions about what we're seeing. Okay. 
Well, I tell you what, um, John, I think that brings us, I think I've had you for five minutes more than, than, uh, than I uh, asked you to do stay for. So thank you. It seems no. like we've not really finished our business and uh, we could talk about this for much longer. So I think um, perhaps we need to talk in the future and perhaps we can liaise again, John, and perhaps you'd like to join us again in the future. Mm -hmm. We talk about like uh, all the other aspects. But if, I'd like to say... You, um... Oh, if, sorry, if you are if you are interested in the trail inside of it, there is a video that I did for um for the, the we we do an international tracking symposium every Feb February in Europe with the European tracking group that I'm involved in, and I think it's on my website. It just it's like half an hour. And it just explains the principles. If you wanted to start finding a trail and seeing if you could follow it, that might be helpful. Yeah, I think um I will I will disseminate that information to uh, the swaggers because I think we're all very interested in that, John on behalf of all of us thank you so much for giving up your tuesday evening for just for a little longer. Mm -hmm. um yeah we've really appreciated it and uh, i think you've given us all food for thought so thank you so much and i will let you know when the youtube's been uploaded and have a great christmas and we'll we'll surely chat again by 2024 perfect thank you very much thank you john thank you everybody and i'm going to stop care, folks. cheerio thanks bye